Well, good evening. I want to welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study as we continue our journey in the season of Lent. I hope it has been a fruitful journey for you so far. We are about halfway done with this journey. As I mentioned on our Sunday service, the hard lifting is yet to come. Of course, not for us, because the hard lifting is that which is done by Jesus Christ. And so we give thanks for that. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the heavy lifting that was done on our behalf on the cross we give you thanks for that. We remember that season 2,000 years ago that still has an impact upon our lives today that can transform our lives. And we're going to hear about that in our Bible study today. So we pray that you would guide and direct our path and our thoughts. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have for our lesson for today a passage from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this is just really a fabulous passage. But before we begin into this, I need you to understand a particular context. Every passage of Scripture has a context. One of the problems with Christians, us, is that we will take one verse out of its context and we will make it say something that the Bible doesn't intend for it to say. You can prove anything you want to if you take the Bible out of context. That's true with any written material. So we need to understand the very particular context in which this is in. And if we read this, first of all, I, I find it really baffling until you understand what sets Paul off on this line of reasoning and thought. And the very first thing we need to understand is that Paul is talking to a divided church. Oops, divided with an E. And this church is divided in all these factions, the people who follow Paul, the people who follow Peter, the people that follow this apostle or that apostle. It's kind of like our denominations today. Well, we we follow the Lutheran Church. Well, we're not ELCA Lutheran. We're Missouri Synod. Well, you folks are all ungodly because we're assemblies of God. Oh, my goodness, you're assemblies of God. Well, we're Baptists, and we're smarter than you. Do you see, these divisions continue to this very day. Now, before we get on to this, let me say, I don't think there's anything wrong with denominations. Not inherently wrong with denominations. Because a Baptist church might be more effective in reaching certain people that we certainly cannot reach. And it's true, too, that there are certain people that we can reach that people in the Assemblies of God can't reach. So I will tell you, I've had discussions with people in Assemblies of God who say, well, we have Lutherans all over the place who just left your church because they didn't find Jesus there. Well, I have people from the Assemblies of God all over the place in my church because they couldn't find God in the Assemblies of God church. Thank God we have both and all of these. And instead of treating it like it's a competition, treating it like we're on the exact same team. What I can do, you cannot do. What you can do, I cannot do, but it's all to the glory of God. You see, this is what was going on in Paul's day, and this is what was ticking them off because they were competing with one another for who was the preeminent apostle or who had the preeminent lineage of Christians who were following this particular apostle. So again, each one claiming that they had special knowledge they were smarter than the next guy. But Jesus, or Paul wants to remind us that we need to be one. One, not necessarily in our political opinions. One, not necessarily in our opinions about what football team we root for. One, not necessarily in terms of all of our social views. But one in what? Jesus. So you already know what he's setting you up for. This is what Paul sets us up for before this. So he says, this is the context. This is what Paul is trying to tell us. And then he goes into our illustration in today's lesson. So let's read this. For the message of the cross. Okay, remember, he's talking to a vital church who are fighting over power, preeminence, who's smarter, who's got the real truth of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness. If you're fighting for power, the cross has gone over your head. 
okay? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So you can be a Christian. But remember, this is the context of this. These are people who claim to be Christians and followers of certain disciples. But yet the message of the cross is going over their head because they think it's about their power. They think it's about them being right, having the right theology, being the only people through whom God is speaking. The message to these types of folks is foolishness because they are perishing. Why? Uh, before we go on, let's talk about that word foolishness. It seems kind of crazy to call the cross foolishness. The cross isn't foolishness, but it appears to be foolishness to those who think that they are right, to those who think they're justified by their belief system, okay? To those who want power, it's foolishness. It is foolishness. Why again? Because we under operate under the assumption that power and control makes the world go round and us having that special knowledge and power over you because we're a better denomination. We're better people. We're better Christians because we believe these things. Then the cross is foolishness. Because you see, you're not basing your salvation then on the cross, but in you having that special knowledge. I'm always cautious of anybody who claims to have special knowledge of God and therefore want to be your authority. I would seriously walk away, especially if they're not willing to have that questioned and examined. Everyone who claims to have special knowledge from God, we have a responsibility to question, turn it upside down, and ask whether or not that person really does have special knowledge or whether they're full of you-know-what. That includes me, by the way. I should be questioned and challenged because it's not my knowledge that brings us together. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus and the cross, that act of submission, okay, is what brings us life and brings us together. To everybody else who doesn't depend upon this, Christians... Again, he's talking to Christians. Christians who do not depend upon the cross, but depend upon their special knowledge, who think that they are better, who think that their denomination is the only right way, are not depending upon this. And they are doing what? They're perishing. Because they are depending upon something that cannot save them. When we depend upon ourselves, our political systems, the creations of our own hands, our denominations, our systematic theologies, our denominations, there's no hope for us. There's no hope for us to be in heaven. We're like grasping for straws. We're still trying to work our way to heaven. This is the only source of salvation. And on this, Paul says, we should be one. Are you a Christian who goes to Assemblies of God Church? Do you believe it is the cross of Christ that saves you and not your denomination and not your systematic theology? Then guess what? You are one with me. Are you Missouri Synod Lutheran? Do you believe that it is only through the cross of Christ? Or do you think you're somehow special because you're Missouri Synod and you're not that evil ELCA Lutheran? Well, if you have that opinion, you're not one with me. You're not even one with Jesus Christ. Do you understand that an ELCA Lutheran who believes in the cross of Christ is your brother, your sister, Okay, you might disagree with just about everything else in their systematic theology. But if we agree upon the cross of Christ as the source of salvation, we are one. 
That was my special effect, by the way. It was kind of my 3D. You had to put your 3D glasses on it to catch that, uh, that marker. All right, let's go on. So we have one message, Paul says. Let me continue on with this. Where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made them foolish? In the wisdom of the world, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. We can't know God through our theologies, through our wisdom. God is pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The foolishness of the cross, an act of submission by Jesus Christ is what unites the world, what brings us together as one, as Christians. Jews demand a signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Okay? Now I know, <laughs> I'm going to just pause for a moment here when we say this, we preach Christ crucified. We don't preach Christ as a baby born in Bethlehem. I know Christmas is everybody's favorite holiday, isn't it? Just fantastic. And I love the simplicity and the innocence of the holiday of Christmas. It's fantastic. But we don't preach Christ, the baby born in Bethlehem. We preach Christ crucified. Because it's the crucifixion, the resurrection. Of course, it takes in that whole thing. He didn't stay dead. But Paul is, of course, implying that second uh, part to it. That crucifixion represents the wholeness of it. It's in the crucifixion, that act of submission, and all be led to the resurrection as well, that brings us salvation. So yes, Jesus had to be born, but without that act of submission, Jesus is just another little baby boy, born in an insignificant town to insignificant parents, and who really cares? It is the cross, and Him crucified, it is this message that we preach in any church, whether we agree on anything else in our theology, we are one. So Christ crucified is a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. We have one message. We will never be satisfied in life, and you will never be satisfied in your walk in Jesus Christ if you continue to think that it is your life is brought to you by your denomination, by your systematic theology, by your politics where you're trying to enact your faith. It only comes through this message. The foolishness of the cross is the salvation of the world. It is in this message that we are one. We can disagree about so many other things. But if you hold out and say, well, you can't be saved because you don't agree with me on all these other things, well, you're perishing. You're grasping for straws. This is what makes us one. Let's pray. Whew. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the one nature that we have in Jesus Christ. Oh, we're going to disagree about a whole lot of things. Being one doesn't mean agreement on all of these things of this world. Or even in totality of our theologies. But we agree on the one thing. It is Christ and Him crucified. It is that which brings us hope in life. And so we ask you to set us free from our human-made isms and systems and make us one in Jesus. Because the world needs us, God. Not us divided. The world needs us the ELCA Lutherans, the Missouri Sin Lutherans, the Baptists, the Assemblies of God. God, do you need all of us? The Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, 
the non-denominational churches, God. Let us see in each other Jesus Christ. Let us see Christ crucified, the hope of the world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We look forward again to seeing you this Sunday.